Welcome back to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato here in my home office, and I'm here with my friend and colleague, Scott Bernstein. Hey, now. And we have our producer, videographer, audio engineer, extraordinaire Benito with us as well. We want to thank you all for joining us. And before we get started, just remind you to please subscribe to our video channel on YouTube and also subscribe to our audio podcast. We're on Spotify, Google, Apple Podcasts, wherever fine podcasts are consumed. And we also uh, are on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and we appreciate your comments and, and questions. And we try to get back to you as soon as we can. Sometimes it takes a bit. So we appreciate your patience. And we're, we're thinking of ways to become even more interactive, if, if, if possible, with our audience. Uh, again, this is a do it yourself operation. The, the, I've beat this, beaten this dead horse before, but the three of us have, have day jobs. <laughs> and so uh, we do this as, as a passion project and a, a labor of love. So, um, but we are always thinking about ways to to deliver more content and to to streamline things and make it more efficient. And one of the things we think about is communicating with the audience and in in a, in a better way, and maybe even doing some live episodes where people can ask Scott questions in real time. I think that that's something we've been been discussing as well. So anyhow, thanks again for listening and and following. Uh, We have a very cool episode today. Uh, I'm excited about this episode. We're going to be talking about the Westies. Uh, This was an Irish mob group out of Hell's Kitchen in New York back in the day. And I would say in terms of non-Italian organized crime groups, this is up there in terms of one of my favorite groups to research and read about. I would say the Purple Gang out of Detroit, the the Jewish syndicate, uh, the Black Mafia in Philadelphia. And then I would say the Westies. That might be like my top three uh, non-Italian favorite non-Italian groups to, to, to research and read about. So um, we're going to start with actually some recent news about this group and then rewind it and, and give you more context and talk about the history of the group. But Scott, uh, you're reporting um, Jimmy Coonan is a name that has uh, come up and you want to explain who that is and what's yeah. going on now with him. And then we'll, we'll break down the history of it. So Jimmy Coonan was, you know, for all intents and purposes, the last boss of the Westies. I know that uh, Bosco um, led it for a little bit after uh, Jimmy went to prison. But Jimmy Coonan was the most notorious Irish crime lord uh, of the 1980s and came up in Hell's Kitchen. Super tough guy who ingratiated himself with the Gambino crime family, Paul Castellano, uh, and took Irish mob affairs in Manhattan and I guess elevated them with that connection to the Gambinos. In the past, that organization had been more at odds with Italians in the, in the Genovese crime family, but uh, Jimmy Coon and, um, Another guy that, you know, I, I would describe as a force of nature, uh, very trigger happy, violent, but uh, at least in his, you know, at the apex in, in his glory days, he was someone that um, was a natural leader and, and got guys to rally behind him uh, and really kind of changed the face of the Irish mafia in New York City. He was convicted in. Uh, what, taken off the streets in 1988, uh, convicted shortly thereafter, uh, his right-hand man and, and de facto underboss, who we'll talk about, uh, Mickey Featherstone, ended up testifying against him. He's been in prison now for 35 years and right now is in a federal uh, correctional institute in Pennsylvania, and he is looking for a compassionate release. He's got seven years left to serve uh, his uh, outdate right now is is 2030, and he's requesting that uh, his federal judge allow him to go serve the remainder of his time on home confinement. He's 76 years old right now uh, on, on home confinement in New Jersey with his w- wife, his longtime wife, Julia, who also will play a role in the, st- the story that we tell. Um, you know, it remains to be seen. He uh, He made this appeal for relief to the court 
last week, uh, August of, of uh, mid to late August of, of 2023. And uh, we'll see. I know that they're having some questions about who's going to make the final decision. The judge that sentenced him is gone. And then for people that don't know how the, 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 um, you know, this is state or federal. If the judge that you were uh, with in your case is no longer on the bench, whether it's retirement or that they're deceased, the case gets reassigned. And that new judge has the same authority as the original judge and, and can, you know, keep you in there longer, let you out earlier. So, um, again, it, it, it's still up in the air whether or not this will be a plea for relief that's granted. Uh, he, wrote a number of letters to the court showing um, in recent letters to the court showing uh, trying to show contrition and that he's not the person that he used to be and that he's learned uh, from his prior devious ways and has kept his nose clean uh, behind bars, mentored younger uh, inmates. I'm not discounting that, but I'll, I'll say that when you're talking about someone like a Jimmy Coonan, uh, someone of that stature and that um, pedigree of of bloodshed. You could be 30 years, 40 years, 50 years removed from it. And it, it's going to be difficult for that, for just the time lapse factor uh, playing in your favor in terms of getting out. At least that's... I mean, Larry Hoover, who's the most you know, notorious black or African-American crime lord in, in America or alleged crime lord. You know, he's been in since 1973. Uh, and and he's tried n- numerous times to uh, fight his way out and, and they, they, they just won't have it. And, and you know, we saw just this month, uh, Vic, Vic Amuso. The boss of the Lucchese crime family. He's 88 years old on his on death's bed. You know, wanted to come home early. They won't let him. So I, if I was an odds maker, I wouldn't put the odds uh, gr- greatly in Jimmy Coonan's favor. But it's it's something for us to, ch- to chop up and, and talk about. And I think we're going to use this as a way to give a little bit of history on, on the Irish mafia in Hell's Kitchen and what eventually became known as the Westies, but it's a group that dates back, uh, you know, towards, you know, well, probably in all, for all intents and purposes, it dates back to like, you know, stuff that you saw in like gangs. Yeah, right. That's a good point. Yeah. If you want to go, if you trace the DNA of it. Yeah, I agree. But, you know, this, you know, that that organization that doesn't exist anymore, we don't believe, uh, you know, the, the roots of of that particular era, you know, were were painted or were planted rather back, uh, you know, uh, prohibition era. Yeah, and Coonan, I imagine he's probably not as old as you might think. Because one thing, when I was prepping for this, I was struck by in his heyday, he was actually a pretty young guy in his heyday. So I know that was a long time ago, but he's probably not. I don't think he's 88, like a Musso, in other words, right? Do you have no, any, he's, seven, he's, seven, he's 76. 76, okay. So so he would have been 30 in the mid-70s, um, but when he was in his teen years, yeah. he was cutting his teeth uh, for some you know major players in, 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 in Hell's Kitchen's Irish underworld. Yeah. Okay. So let, well, let's go back to the, let, let's set the, the stage here. Let's go back to the fifties and sixties before the rise of Coonan and this, and the so-called Westies. We're looking at the Irish mob in Hell's Kitchen. As Scott talks about, this goes back um, a long way, Irish neighborhood, although it was a mixed neighborhood. It wasn't exclusively Irish, but it was known as an Irish neighborhood. And up until that point, they're basically viewed as like these gentlemen racketeers, uh, policy bosses, some some bookmaking, and um, if you owed money, you might be in trouble. But but for the most part, these guys were not viewed by people in the neighborhood as ruthless gangsters or or crime lords. And by the 1960s, Mickey Spillane takes over, and he's he's an important person in this it, narrative. Should we, should we point out that it, start, it started with a guy named Huey Mulligan? Yeah, Huey. Mul- yeah, Huey Mulligan was the boss before. before and Huey Spillane. was. And wasn't Huey the one that was kind of 
initially crafted that gentleman gangster yeah. persona. Yeah, he was like a politically connected guy, policy boss, so like numbers, bookmaking, um, not necessarily involved in the, the rough stuff that we think of with, with the underworld. And he was very popular in the neighborhood, politically connected. He is replaced by Mickey Spillane. And Mickey Spillane is an interesting guy because he's able to really have a foot in both kind of environments. He has a reputation. He continues that reputation as a guy who looks out for the neighborhood, a gentleman racketeer. He was well-dressed, popular guy, well-liked. He was married into a prominent political family, local political family. And by the way, their wedding, that was like a big to do in that, in that neighborhood. It was like, it was like royalty, you know? And, but more so than Huey Mulligan, Splane was also more gangsta than, than Mulligan was, even though Spillane did a good job of crafting this image of, of a guy who was, you know, more of a, a low key, more polished. Yeah. More polished, but he, but he had, you know, um, been uh, charged for uh, armed robbery assault. It was believed he was involved in murder. So he was a guy that was not to be trifled with um, a little bit more intense than, than what they were used to in, in hell's kitchen. And, um, but but he he's able to to keep this reputation as a as a as a gentleman gangster. Um the Irish control the the West Side docks and they also have a piece of the action at Madison Square Garden. So we're talking about Manhattan if you've ever been to New York and know where that is. Um but with all these lucrative rackets, he does have to play nice with the Genovese crime family, which is also known as the West Side. So they're in that in that area. And um that's that's a really important kind of subtext to this story because if the more ambitious Blaine gets, the more potential he's going to get into trouble with with the Genovese, and they do something. Spillane's crew, uh, they do something that's pretty remarkable, and I would say reckless. They actually kidnap one of the Genovese policy guys and, and it, was, the way, yeah go ahead scott go ahead. i want to say it's little eli zaccardi who you're talking yeah. about yeah and i just want to point out that he was more than just uh a rung on the ladder of the genovese he was a he was in the administration or an acting member of the administration yeah and when we talk about policy we're talking about numbers we're talking about right. the old lottery so it's it's remarkable that they decide to kidnap him <laughs> and hold him for ransom and basically shake down the Genovese crime family. So they kidnap him and uh, they get the ransom and they kill him. They kill him anyhow. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, immediately Spillane has a big target on his back now from, from the Genovese. But if that weren't bad enough for him, this is still the late 1960s. He's now starting to face opposition from within the neighborhood as well, a group of young Turks. And in a way, I was talking to Scott about this before we started recording. In, a, in the way I see a parallel with what happened with in Philadelphia with, with Marlino and his guys, um, these kind of young ruffians and the, the primary person we're talking about here is, again, Jimmy Coonan. But he's got this group of guys around him, young guys. And just like Merlino and those guys, like they didn't get the memo that when you're when you're a young teenager that you're supposed to toe the line <laughs> and, and wait see, your turn. Right? I, I'd see the difference would be that the Merlino crew, at least in terms of the mafia, they were polished. They were, um, they were more. Uh, I don't. I don't know how I want to describe it. They weren't like street thugs. Is, is that what you right? Mean? The Coonan and his crew were just, they were like a ragtag yeah. rogues gallery of gritty, vicious alcoholics, <laughs> alcoholic killer gangsters. You know, jo Joey and his crew might, might be like that at, at some level, but, uh, but the layers and the veneer is, is a little bit different. Yeah. I think that's a fair, yeah, that's a, that's a fair point. In terms and I, and of, I also want to point out, uh, I can't. I don't want to claim to be an expert on uh, e Eli Zaccardi, but um, you know there are people that claim that he wasn't just a policy racketeer. He wasn't just 
in the in the administration with the Genovese, there are people that say that he was an acting boss. So I just want to be able to um, explain or contextualize the the balls, if you will, that it took for these Irish guys to attack the, the Genovese in that way. I mean, like I said, this wasn't a this wasn't a situation like when you I know we do a lot of Sopranos references, but when when the war was going on between, uh, you know, Tony and the guys in New York, you know, they find Benny and they beat the shit out of Benny. Oh, right. Yeah. Right. Because That's a low that's a low level guy to make yeah. a statement with. But Eli Zaccardi, little Eli Carmine Zaccardi's real name. That was a big fish that they took out. Yeah, it was pretty, re- pretty remarkable. And I, and I would say, you know, pretty reckless uh, for them. So Spillane has to look out on, on either side, because as you point out, Coonan and his this group of ruffians he has, they're they're They want to take over. Right. They, they do not want to to fall in line and, uh, you know, pay tribute to to Spillane. And as you point out, these guys were killers. Like they weren't they weren't joking. Like they were, th- this wasn't like something that like escalated. I mean, they they were like right away, like we're gonna fucking kill Spillane and take over. They didn't make any like there's no subtlety <laughs> to, the, to their plans or designs. So Spillane has to has to lay low. But I think I want to add something to this, and then and then you could comment on this, Scott, um, because this individual is going to play a, a role in this story again later. But for now. Jimmy Coonan, although he's he's with these young Irish guys in Hell's Kitchen, he also has already as a young man a connection to um, some significant underworld players, specifically Ruby Stein, yeah. who is a, like a prolific loan shark, uh, Genovese connected loan shark in that area. And Jimmy Coonan uh, is also I don't know if you'd say moonlighting would be the way to put it as his bodyguard and collector as like so, a teenager, as a teenager. So he's um, he's got one foot in like the kind of the, the the rough and tumble streets of Hell's Kitchen, but he's also getting some exposure to more sophisticated racketeering. So um, Ruby Stein's going to come up again later. But do you have any any insight into Ruby Stein? You want to? Well, I mean, I think add? Ruby Stein. I'll just say that not to to more of a tease than to to, to give away uh, what we're about you know the ending of the story, but. You know, Mickey Spillane and Ruby Stein were the old guard. And whatever their relationships or connections were with the younger guys at one point, it didn't matter by the time that, you know, we reached the the point in the story where where things come to a head. So I just think it, you know, the, the old school versus the new school. And if you're somebody that is in the new school, uh, looking to plant your own flag, I don't think it it matters that uh, Jimmy Coonan had come up under Ruby Stein. Yeah, yeah. There's no sentimentality. Yeah, <laughs> that's what we'll discover. So um, there's also this interesting point that Coonan has a personal grudge with Spillane because right. um, Spillane's group had kidnapped Coonan's father, which is an interesting biographical note about Coonan. Even though what you would, you would look at Coonan's behavior at this point, Coonan is not like he was born in like impoverished in like the, you know, the, 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 the bad side of town. Uh, his parents were professionals is I think his dad was like a tax accountant or something like that. So they, they were by those standards of the 1960s, they were relatively middle-class. And um, so, as a result, he, the father was targeted by Spillane and his group to like shake him down, and they, the kid, they kidnapped, they kidnapped him. him for yeah. for a ransom. Yeah, yeah, and I guess they roughed him up, and so Coonan remembered that as a kid. It's again, we like to compare these things to like cinema. Like it, it doesn't, it does remind you of something from a movie, right? That like yeah. the, the young kid would be like waiting, you know, waiting and counting his days until he's old enough to avenge avenge yeah. the father, right? Find, rep, find retribution for his, his old man. Yeah, because his father was humiliated. So uh, he also has this personal grudge against Kunin. And eventually this erupts into a shooting war between Spillane's guys and uh, Kunin's guys. And they they, they call it the, the Kunin-Spillane Wars. And 
one thing I wanted to note, this kind of cultural shift that I think is interesting in Hell's Kitchen at this time is this narrative really starts to shift from like these gentlemen racketeers to this is like gangland violence because up until that point, yeah, a guy might take a beating once in a while if he was behind on his payments. Maybe a guy would disappear and you know people would keep it low key even though everyone knew what happened. But at this point, this is like a shooting war where they're targeting each other. Let's see a guy coming out of a bar and they they fucking whack him. And in other cases, you know, guys like bodies were getting hacked up. Body parts were being found and it was getting pretty gruesome. And the the, the kind of perception in the neighborhood started this shift that maybe these aren't gentlemen racketeers. Like this is some serious gangland shit we're, we're witnessing. I think there was another thing at play that will evolve as the story goes on which is it went from Irish versus Italian and then the Italian influence starts to make its way into the kitchen um, but not necessarily as rivals they see Coonan as an entry point into those rackets. So while Spillane was always at odds with the Genovese, Hoonan, and I think, you know, he served some prison time, uh, I think in state prison. Sing Sing. In Sing Sing. And I think he met uh, met, met some guys uh, there as well uh, from the you know, from his neighborhood that he didn't know, or not from, from certain Manhattan Italian factions. Uh, and you know, th- th- that's a factor that didn't really come into play until the 70s when y- you had these y- these alliances, I guess, that started to develop. And it wasn't, you know, uh, it didn't necessarily come down between ethnic lines. No, that's a good point. Yeah, I think j- and we're going to expand on this soon. But Jimmy Coonan was definitely more open minded, let's say, about collaborating with the italians where Spillane viewed it as as basically competition right or sell or selling out or selling out right Right. he had a much Spillane had a much more complicated relationship with the italians than than kunin did as as we'll find out so another thing that's interesting i think during this war is because this goes i think of this with the sopranos too that that conflict you're talking about between jersey and and the uh johnny Sachs family or the Lupertazzi family, uh, uh, Kunin's guys, who, by the way, in the press, they start referring to as the Westies because of, um, you know, the West End, Hell's Kitchen. The Westies start shaking down all of Spillane's local operations because we mentioned Spillane had a piece of Madison Square Garden. He had a piece of the docks, but there was also all the local stuff, bookmaking, loan sharking, um, and... um, whatever kind of dope dealing was going on there that the, Spillane controlled that and Cooner and his guys go to all the local bookies and dope dealers and loan sharks and say, you pay us now, you don't kick up to Spillane anymore or we'll kill you. And like you saw in the, in the Sopranos, like basically it comes down to who are you more afraid of? And the people on the street were more afraid of Jimmy Cooner. <laughs> and so a lot of the people just like that basically just shifted shift i don't loyalty is not the right word but like uh shifted their priorities and we're just like we're gonna kick up to the westies now it was really a um uh what we call hostile takeover of the streets and and spillane is on the run at that point wouldn't you be if you were a um a (laughs) store owner in hell's kitchen wouldn't you be more afraid of what coonan and his guys could do to you than what spillane and his guys could do to you yeah yeah i mean and that goes back to also part of the perception of spillane seemed like a diplomatic guy you could work with as opposed to coonan who comes in crazy eyed crazy eyed killer isn't that from like bulls in a china shop curb your enthusiasm remember crazy eyed yeah (laughs) So, right. So um, there's no, like I said, there's no subtlety or diplomacy with those guys. So, yeah, the, people are afraid of them. And um, but as you point out, uh, Kunin does end up doing some time. So he is off the streets for a while, which is which gives Spillane a little bit a little bit more time. Um, he's there's a shooting. And um, I don't think the person was killed, 
uh, but they were seriously injured. And uh, I think Coonan does like four years or something like that for, I don't know what you're the lawyer. I don't know what that would be like aggravated assault or something yeah. like that with a weapon. And he does some time at Sing Sing. And at this point, I think we should introduce another significant person. We've, we've already mentioned this person once, but while Coonan is away, Mickey Featherstone comes back to the neighborhood yep. and Vietnam. Yeah. He was a Vietnam vet and he was serving over in uh, Southeast Asia. And he, and, he, we should point yeah, out that ahead. he had, he joined the military for wartime service when he was like 16, he lied about his age. Uh, yeah. So he was in combat when most people were in high school. Yeah. Yeah. And he is uh, a very tough individual uh we know from his psychiatric evaluations while he was in the u.s military they determined that he was unfit for service and uh they actually considered him uh psychotic so he is um looking for something to do let's say when he gets home he he actually wants to re-enlist and they won't let him because of the the psychiatric evaluation so Keep an eye on him if you're following this story. Uh, in the meantime, because Coonan's off the street, Spillane is able to reorganize a bit, and he's not he's not gone yet. Um, unfortunately for him, um, the Genovese are like, well, if Coonan's gone and he ain't going to take care of him, then <laughs> then we're gonna we're gonna come after him. So uh, going back to the Zaccardi uh, yeah. incident, and so. Then they hire yeah, Mad right. Dog. They, they hire Mad Dog Sullivan, right? Yeah, and do you, you you want to talk about him a little bit because he's sort of another street legend in that. Yeah, you know, he what he was a Irish hitman that was didn't he take work from anybody and everybody? Uh, he wasn't just doing hits for Irish mob guys. Uh, he was working a lot with the Italians and and doing hits uh, around the country. Yeah, he's a freelancer. Yeah, so. Um, you know, when when uh, someone like Mad Dog Sullivan comes looking for you or or is retained by an organization to, uh, you know, wreak havoc on you, you and your organization. It, it, back then, most times it didn't turn out well for the person that was on the receiving end of of a, a assignment being given to Mad Dog Sullivan to eliminate said competition. Yeah, so he he actually does take out. I think I think at least three of Spillane's the guys in his inner circle. They don't get to Spillane himself, but they take out the guys in his inner circle. Mad Dog Sullivan does. So again, Spillane is on the ropes at this point. He not only he barely survived the conflict with Kunin. Now the Genovese are coming after him. They take out his inner circle, and um. To, to make matters worse for Splane, Coonan is out of prison and he reacquaints himself with an old acquaintance, Mickey Featherstone, and they, they form an alliance. And as you point out, Featherstone really becomes the number two for all intent and purpose of the Westies at that point. And then they get back up from the Gambinos. And at yeah. that point, it's game over. <laughs> for Spillane, right? right. right. It's getting squeezed on too many so on too many sides. At first, it comes from you know um, an overture comes from Roy DeMeo, who very infamous mob psychopath. Uh, you know, you could categorize him as a serial killer. I mean, he wasn't. He killed for fun. He was a scary uh, guy. Um, and uh, he had his own crew, known as like the Gemini Gemini Lounge Crew was a capo under Paul Castellano, big money maker, as well as a guy that they used for muscle assignments. And uh, he had an underling named Danny Grillo, who I think Coonan had met in Sing Sing. Maybe. I'm, I'm not positive, but it could be. Uh, and, and Grillo uh, reaches out and says, you know, DeMeo wants to have a meeting of the minds. Yeah, and we some more shameless self promotion. If you listen to some of our episodes we've done with Anthony Arolota, who was a member of the the Springfield crew of the uh, Genovese family in, in Massachusetts, um, he said in that area on the East Coast, Italian and Irish guys do a lot of time together. 
and they become friendly with each other. And then those, those friendships extend to the streets in terms of business collaborations and things like that. So this is not like an unusual situation where an Irish dude and Italian dude would, would meet in prison, find common ground. And then once on the streets, re, you know, reestablish that network. And then um, the de- Mayo yeah, served as a bridge to Castellano. Right. And not, now you're playing with the big boys. Now you're right. Now you're playing with the big boys. So part of the logic was um, Kunin knows that Spillane is on the ropes, but Kunin also recognizes, I think Scott and I are really interested in like underworld politics and, and how this like chess game is played. Kunin recognizes that if he removes Spillane, it, it's not like all of his problems are solved because there's still the Genovese <laughs> looming large in that neighborhood. So as Scott points out, Kunin makes this really smart preemptive move, which is to go to the Gambinos and, and get, get their cosign, them. get their co-signage. And it, it goes from, I, I don't even want to say, I, I don't know if it started as one thing and became another, but it's pretty clear that, this wasn't a situation where it was just some type of protection arrangement. This was like a corporate yeah. take the way that uh, that Kunin and them tried a hostile or uh, launched a hostile takeover. It, this wasn't hostile, but you had the Gambinos absorbing the Irish mob. Basically. It's like a merger, a merger. Right. If we're, we're gonna, you were gonna, we're gonna <laughs> right, we're gonna make you the the Irish. Hell's Kitchen wing of the Gambinos. I think that's what I think that's how a good way it was to put it. Right. Yeah, I think I think that's a good way to put it. And as you point out, he already had these connections with guys like like Grillo and DeMeo. And it's really interesting how audacious, audacious um Kunin is because in the middle of this like diplomatic maneuvering with the Gambinos, which I, I want to get to the sit down with Castellano in a moment, but before before that happens. Kunin, it's really remarkable that he, he thinks that this is a good idea, but he got away with it. His mentor, Ruby Stein, who he was, before he went to prison, was a collector and bodyguard for, who's a big deal in, in that in that area, uh, especially a, especially his Shylock business is like one of the biggest, right? And, and, the, and Kunin's good with the guy, right? He worked for him. That was his mentor. Kunin decides that we're going to kill him and then take his shy business, and that'll be like uh, kind of some startup money for us to really be able to play. Well, in, that will be the, the money. That will be the money that we can filter to Castellano and Company and get in their good graces. Yeah, get their attention. <laughs> yeah. Um, right. And this wasn't something that this. I think it can't be overstated that, and it will play out as the years go on. This wasn't something that Coonan resisted this is something that kunin embraced oh he yeah. wanted to have the gambinos um co-signing or affiliation or alliance uh, a because it gave him more muscle than he'd ever had before but also there was a cachet to it the, it was a status symbol and yeah. at that point the gambinos were arguably the you know the most powerful family in in the country yeah i think that's a that's a really interesting point that this is the 1970s early 1970s to mid 1970s and he he, Kunin actually would articulate this to to the guys around him like this ain't the old school where like the Irish can can be insulated and and the Irish can just be like uh, provincial like the Italians are the game in town right now and if we want to survive and if we want to prosper we need to have a relationship and have more relationship than we had previously precisely so um i think that that's interesting that he had that insight uh because you it's hard to argue with that um with that um logic and, at that point and he has the gambinos actually whack ruby stein right right Allegedly. yeah i um well i think i think actually um, it's. I think Ruby Stein. It was still the Westies that that did it, um, because Castellano actually asks Kunin about it. Like if okay. they if they they did it, the, the Gambinos are going to take out someone significant <laughs> momentarily in the story. But um, 
they kill Ruby Stein, and it's pretty gruesome. I, Benny, if you want to put up the the image of the uh, newspaper headline, um, I was confu- they, I was confusing two different heads. Yeah, 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 yeah. So again, I think Scott already mentioned this. Ruby Stein's a big deal. Uh, he's obviously not Italian, but he's uh, a prominent Jewish underworld figure, and he's a big deal. And so when he is murdered, this is front page news and the uh westies take over the action and um he was he was tied to jigs forlano who uh ruby stein was kicking up to forlano and who, who, who what family was was he genovese or um colombo or genovese i'll find out in a second okay um I think what Scott was talking about that the Gambinos allegedly kill was on May 13th, 1977, Mickey Spillane is, is finally killed. Uh, people have been gunning for him for a long time as we've established. And I think it's interesting when you look at it from a forensic perspective, because Mickey Spillane knows that mad dog Sullivan and the Genovese are coming after him. He knows that Coonan's coming after him. And now that Coonan's backed by the Gambinos. Mm-hmm. Jigs was a Jigs was a Colombo capo. A Colombo, okay. So Ruby was definitely a connected guy. Um, so Spillane is laying low. He knows people are gunning for him. So someone lures him out of his house. I think he's unarmed. He doesn't have a bodyguard with him. So somebody, presumably somebody he trusted, gave him up, lures him out to the street, and they whack him. So Spillane is out of the way. And I think this is what Scott was thinking of with with the Gambinos is uh, I think DeMeo and Grillo go to Coonan and were like Merry Christmas or something, <laughs> something like that, that uh, now you are 100 percent in charge of Hell's Kitchen. We made sure of mm-hmm. that. And as a result, uh, the big guy would like to have uh, uh, you know, would like to have your audience with you. audience with you. Big Paul, the, the Pope, yeah. the Pope. Right. Big Pauly Castellano. And as you point out, that's no joke. That's not like some con- random connected guy that you did time with in the joint, uh, you know, an associate or a soldato. Um, Castellano is you're being arguably, called to the White House. You're being called to the White House. Right. He's arguably one of the most powerful uh, mafiosi in the in the country, um, even internationally at at that point. And so they have a meeting. And, and let's, let's also point out that this was something that made Jimmy Coonan very oh, happy. Yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah. it, it wasn't like he was leery of going to meet Castellano or wanted to make sure that, that you know, politically they had all their ducks in a row so they could go and negotiate. with. No, he went with, you know, with bells on running towards Castellano because he knew that Castellano wanted you know, to embrace him. And and he wanted to be embraced by by a by a big Italian mafia. Though. No, he he totally viewed this as a coup. Like this was like, I mean, a big deal for him. Um, we're scoring points here because Featherstone and those guys were telling Coonan, "Are we sure we want to do this? Like, what if this yeah. is a setup? What if they're what if they're going to whack us?" And to your point, Coonan is like, "We fucking crazy. Like this is what we've want. This is what we've wanted. A, literally a seat at the table. Yeah, with with." Getting- Castellano, De La Croce. Um, I, there were some other Gambino heavyweights there. I can't remember who the other guys were, um, uh, other administrators. At the, I know De La Croce and Castellano were obviously there. And Coonan is like, this is what we wanted. Mm-hmm. Um, so they go. And th- this is another kind of interesting cultural shift is now that they're, they're getting a seat at the table, literally with Castellano, Coonan and Featherstone show up suit and tie yeah <laughs> well time. then eventually with with uh coon and he he moves out of hell's kitchen moves to new jersey where all uh where there were a lot of you know italian mob administrators that were living out of this out of the city uh coming into the city to do business but but living in new jersey and like you said they started uh, dressing acting talking wearing pinky rings <laughs> uh and it and it didn't necessarily play well with the rank and file back in Hell's Kitchen. No, I, I agree. Um, and uh, so I, I want to uh, uh, get to that in a moment, but just so a few more details coming out of the, the the first conference that they have with each other. I, I like the I like this like Castellano, like this, this is a boss move. Like it's not like a negotiation. Castellano just tells him you're with us now. 
<laughs> you're with yep. us now, as you point out, you're going to be the Irish crew of the Gambinos. Like this isn't a negotiation. No, and, we're not and, asking. And, and by the way, you should thank me. That's and what. You should, thank, you should thank me for this. <laughs> Which I'm Kuna doing was, a favor, buddy. Which yeah. Kuna was like, yeah, I yeah. I, uh, I yeah. agree. That's what yeah. this was all about. That's yeah. that's why I wanted to fuck with you guys in the first place. Like this is incredible co-signing. And so the Castellano lays out the details. Again, it's non-negotiable. It says from now on, we get 10% of all your action in Hell's Kitchen, the the gambling, the shy, the uh dope, anything like that. We get 10% of. But this is the key for this is why. This is important for Jimmy Kuhn, and not only in terms of status, but economically. The Castellano says, and also you will get in on our construction and labor rackets. And as you know, people that follow this show know about the underworld, that's where the real money is, right? It ain't no, in no show jobs. It ain't necessarily shaking down fucking deadbeat gamblers, right? Who wants to do that? all day skim when, union cough skim labor union coffers and no show jobs right right when you could get in on that and and uh you know uh no no bid contracts for construction and things like that couldn't is smart enough to recognize that's a much more lucrative these are much more lucrative opportunities than just shaking down fucking you know deadbeat uh people that own my own for, or own, own bars in hell's kitchen yeah, right, right, shaking down right borrow taverns and in, uh in hell's kitchen so it, it's a pretty smart move by um um kunin but i think this is really fascinating as as you've already mentioned but kunin maybe takes it a little bit too far uh for like the rank and file because he moves out of the neighborhood and he really starts exclusively associating with the Italians. And, you know, Featherstone's one of the few guys that have access to him. And Kunin basically becomes pretty aloof in Hell's Kitchen. Like, he's not around anymore. He's not like the local Don or Irish Don or and something. He, and he's not worried about it. And it's not, not, some, really it's not something that's causing him great consternation that the boys back home are starting to lose faith in him or uh, or or judging him. Uh, or might try to uh, rally against him. He he sees it. He, he thinks to himself, even if that's true, I got Castellano on my back. Good luck <laughs> if you want to rally against me. Right. If you want to make a move. Right. Yeah. What does say? What does Tony say back to the Sopranos when he says, "Well, if someone doesn't like it, make a move." What was that? Was that what was that situation when Tony said? Was that with Richie? No. When um yes no uh Silvio says something to Tony about like some there's some like rumblings with the rank and file like are upset with how you're doing oh, it was a, you know it was about it was when he was protecting his cousin oh and then was it tony, it was like, tony make, B, he wouldn't give up tony, he couldn't he wouldn't give up tony b to leotardo yeah and then what tony says if someone doesn't like it they can make a move or something yeah. like that so that's sort of kunin's attitude right yeah um but yeah the the rank and file are not only annoyed including featherstone by the way are annoyed with this because a Kunin is acting Italian. He's moved out of the neighborhood. He's not like Mickey Spillane, which was, again was sort of Mickey Spillane was sort of like this local Irish Don, a man about town, kissing babies, shaking hands in the neighborhoods. Kunin's not like that. He's a you know this like absentee crime no, lord. Kunin, Kunin <laughs> thinks that he's a member of the Gambino crime family right now, and he wants to go hang out in Italian social clubs and eat at Italian restaurants and and be seen in Manhattan with big time Gambinos. Right. Right. And and this alienates the rank and file, not only on a cultural level, but also on a, a financial level, because Kunin's to the extent that he gives a shit, as you point out, I'm not sure he was that concerned, but to the extent Featherstone or others bring this to his attention, he's like, look, we have this lucrative deal with the Gambinos. Like, wh why, why, why should anyone complain about this? And the rank and file were saying, you have. A, yeah. a lucrative deal benefiting, with the it's benefiting you it's not benefiting me <laughs> right the construction and labor raggets they let you in on but that's not trickling that's not trickling down to the guys on the street who are still shaking down the tavern owners and you know selling nickel bags or whatever so there's already this kind of tension um emerging even though like you said kunin's on cloud nine because of this this relationship and um Meanwhile, Kunin still has this impulsive um, 
what we'd say pension for Strength. violence. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, if he if he does run into a guy at the bar that he doesn't like or a guy that talks shit, he doesn't hes- hesitate to pistol whip the guy, beat the guy. And and eventually there's another shooting uh, that they get in trouble for. They don't get convicted of murder, but Coonan does take a gun possession. He does get pinched for gun possession. And Featherstone around the same time takes a pinch for counterfeiting um and so they both go away they're both off the street but this relationship with the gambinos is so cemented that really business just goes on as usual there's a couple of other high-ranking westies that just step in and really business goes on as usual well, with the gambinos it, it should be pointed out that they they use their wives yes as, as conduits point, yeah. to yeah. the gambinos they trusted yeah. uh mickey and jimmy trusted their significant others to not just hold the house down when they're gone but hold the whole organization down and it it's uh it's you know tailor made for hollywood and there's been at least two movies in the last five years that were um at the very least inspired by that story one directly called the kitchen with melissa mccarthy i never saw it but it's clearly based on that um, the one that I did saw that I liked, which was moved into modern times and take place in Chicago, was called Widows uh, with Viola Davis and Liam Neeson. Uh, but both of the both those films, the plot point was that these women take over for their gangland uh, boss husbands that have to go to prison. Yeah, actually, took that, that, took that story from the from the Westies. That's a great point. Yeah, I, I, I was seeing these high ranking Westies guys, but he, but that you're absolutely right. Those guys were actually still just the muscle. The wives, Featherstone and Coonan's wives, were actually calling the shots and keeping things and uh, communicating. That's a great point. And keeping keeping communication in some way, some shape or form with the Gambinos. I mean, they yeah. weren't going to meet with Paul Castellano. No, but they were still uh, coordinating. With, yeah. with the game being. And and that's interesting that this will, I don't want to digress too much, but females in the underworld, we're seeing this um some examples of this in, in Italy, uh even in Sicily, uh, but also Calabria and um uh Capania with the uh, Camorra, that even though these are like real machismo cultures, right? Women obviously can't be initiated into these societies, but so many guys either get killed or end up in prison that you've gotten to this point of attrition where like in some cases it just makes more sense for the wives to become the shot callers for all intent and purpose, because a, not everyone has access to these guys in prison. Some of them are in max security prison, but the wives still have access to them. And uh, they have the the pedigree. Usually, usually the wives are really are like the daughters of, of someone else who's, who's juiced in. And so um, it's a really interesting situation where, this macho culture and yet these these women have this elevated cool. status and to tie it back into today this is just me speculating i would guess that whoever has to make that decision about whether Kunin can come home or not it doesn't play in his favor that he's coming home to somebody that is at one time was a co-conspirator it wasn't <laughs> just his wife right. and she's 80 years old she's four years older than him so I doubt that the 80-year-old uh, Julia Coonan and 76-year-old Jimmy Coonan, if he was released in the near future, would be going out and running rackets out of New Jersey. But <laughs> I it, doubt it. Yeah. If he had a if he had someone that he was coming home to that didn't have a criminal record, it probably would work more in his favor. But I digress. Yeah, and just uh, some uh, foreshadowing of a, an episode we're going to do soon this idea of females in the underworld um the great reporter deborah bonello is going to be on soon she wrote a book narcas the secret rise of women in latin america's cartel so we're going to explore this more soon on the show but anyhow um yeah so so things are the machine keeps on uh churning here but a couple of things complicate the situation a featherstone himself has pretty much had enough of Coonan's like, I'm just an Italian guy. I'm with the Gambinos. They view him as, as too greedy. Also, not only is fucking with the Italians too much, but being too greedy, but then the wives start feuding with each other as well. It actually like really like some really public um, confrontations at like 
parties, like holiday parties and things like that, because they're all part of the same social circle mm -hmm. where they really get into it with each other, the wives. I think at one point, Featherstone's wife even like threatens to kill threatens to kill Coonan's wife. wife yeah. <laughs> so um, things are um, getting complicated. Some other complications related to the Gambinos is Roy DeMeo gets, gets clipped, <laughs> gets killed. You want to talk about that situation? Well, he, be, he just became more uh, trouble than he was worth in Castellano's mind. Uh, and he, there's, there just was a lot of exposure. He, yeah. you, were, you were killing, uh, killing guys at a clip that was really uh, raising, <laughs> I use the term raising red flags for the, for the uh, authorities, but you know, it, it, it became very conspicuous and it wasn't a secret where these bodies, A, were, <laughs> were ending up uh, or, or who was responsible for it. Uh, he got caught in a big, um, stolen car ring case that were where he was i think they were moving cars uh, outside of the united states like i don't i don't want to speak to it as someone that knows all the particulars but yeah. it involved international law where where uh the, the stealing cars chop shops stuff being sent to the middle east to um and Castellano thought that De DeMeo uh, could open up on him. Yeah. And, and um, as you point out, right, his, his, his act was getting old of being like the, the psychotic and for a while. Castellano like viewed it as an asset that DeMeo was right. close to him and he was so feared, right. That he might be a psychopath, but he's my psychopath. Right. And people are afraid of him, but eventually that act got old. Um, and so DeMeo is killed. But Danny Marino becomes Coonan's new contact, and Marino assures Coonan this has no bearing on our relationship. You were, you know, you and DeMeo were tight, but this says, like, as far as we're concerned, it's business as usual. And and that's what and that's what happens. And so Coonan is able to hold things down for a while. But then in 1985, something else happens that could potentially disrupt this relationship. It actually doesn't, but Big Paul Castellano is killed. And everyone who watches this show or listens to this show knows that story. John Gotti, uh, you know, puts together this conspiracy with Gravano and other high ranking members and they um, move against Castellano. Castellano was killed in it's December. I can't remember the exact date. I don't know if you remember the date he's killed him. It's December uh, well, outside. Ca of Sparks, Castellano was killed on my parents wedding anniversary. December 6th. <laughs> December that's a coincidence. Yeah, December 16th, 1985. Yeah. So outside of Spark Steakhouse, uh, well-known um, kind of a uh, high-end restaurant in Manhattan. And so this is potentially another disruption to this relationship, but it actually isn't because Coonan and Gotti have a sit down and they're like two peas in a pod, right? right. <laughs> he, he ends up actually having a stronger relationship with, with, with Gotti versus Castellano. Because as you point out, Castellano still had this sort of regal kind of uh, aura well, he, about him. He had, it was well, sort of, Castellano alienated himself from his troops. So. <laughs> yeah, right, right. In a similar way that Kuna was doing his rank and file. But Castellano, even though he was working with Kuna, and you know Castellano, he sort of still had this sort of pretentious kind of attitude to Kunin, whereas Gotti viewed Kunin as like, this is my, this is my kind of guy, right? We're two peas in the pod. So Kunin is actually probably more comfortable i would say with working with Gotti than he is with castellano and Gotti gives the westies the contract for john o'connor right who the was union, union uh, guy yeah uh, uh a union guy who uh I, I can't remember all the details did he send guys to beat o'connor's so o yeah o'connor sent some guys to the, his guys beat up some guys that were connected to the gambinos or something like that yeah i, I just want to uh, point out i'm not I just looked up. I'm not positive if DeMeo was facing a case at the end of his life. I think he was. But for the most part, he had like 40 open homicides uh, where feds and local authorities were deep diving the Gemini lounge crew. And and like I said, that's three over three dozen bodies. Yeah. So either 
again, I don't want to claim to be an expert on Roy DeMeo, but I also don't want people to be <laughs> chiming in in the comments that we got it wrong. But uh, just know that, you know, Castellano wanted to cut ties from DeMeo because DeMeo had become too much of a headache and presented, you know, too much exposure on, on uh, the Gambino higher ups because they had been the ones that had been giving the DeMeo crew a lot of those contracts. So a lot of them had been just DeMeo on its own, too. But I think there were 38 open homicide investigations in the early 80s that were tied to uh, the DeMeo crew. And Castellano just didn't want to deal with it. He tried to give the contract to John Gotti. Gotti didn't want to take the contract because he was worried. I'm kind of afraid of him, wasn't he? Up, upset. <laughs> well, thinking if he missed or if he was successful, that he'd have DeMeo loyalists wanting to um, get retribution. I eventually gave it to Frankie DiCicco. Yeah. 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 DeMeo wasn't someone to be, to be trifled with. So you had to, I didn't mean that. Careful. I just wanted to make sure. We yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Oh, that's good. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I want to be, I want to be, um, I want to restate something. I don't think they gave the contract to the Westies to kill O'Connor. They wanted the Westies to, to rough him up. But the Westies decide we're just gonna kill, we're just gonna kill them. So back to this idea of them be kind of rogue, even as even as like connected to the Gambinos are, um, you can only um, you know I'm not sure how much you can civilize. Uh, uh, I don't know if that's the right way to put it. But the Westies are who they are, right? Yep. And so they can wear pinky rings and go to these fancy Italian restaurants, but like there's still some tough motherfuckers who like killing people. So. They're supposed to send a message to O'Connor, but they try to kill him. They shoot him several times. And I think O'Connor survives. Mm -hmm. I believe yeah, he right? wasn't killed. Yeah. He wasn't killed because he was called. He was supposed to testify against Gotti, I think. And he doesn't do it. Mm -hmm. I for Gotti. Remember the, mm -hmm. the, <laughs> the newspaper headline? Yeah. Um, but <laughs> so the Westies find themselves in this, you know, this potential pickle where the Gambino said, we said, beat the guy up, not, not kill him. Um, Meanwhile, Featherstone and the other top Westies, guys like Kevin Kelly, Jimmy McElroy, they decide that we just have to take out Coonan uh, for these things that we've already established. Coonan's too aloof. He's too greedy. He, he's, he's more with the Italians than he is with us. And I think that we should also point out, it's really interesting, and, and I think there's a comparison with like Whitey Bulger's group when you talk about the Irish mob. The Westies had a lot of juice for a crew of uh, it's not like it's not like we're talking about a crime family of 60, 70 guys. I mean, it was basically around 20 guys, 20 guys. Yeah. Of um, And they, they had like associates and things like that, too. But in terms of like hardcore Westies, we're only talking about a group of like 20 guys, but they were they were <laughs> pretty, pretty scary dudes. And so they had, um, you know, a lot more juice than you might expect for a crew of 20 guys. But some of the other high-ranking guys, or at least guys that, that have more stature, and Featherstone decide to move against Kunin. And it's sort of interesting, I think, politically, because back to this kind of impulsive thing, where at least Kunin was, was a, I think, a guy who was strategizing and thinking about things like on a chessboard. My understanding is that Featherstone and those guys are just like, we're tired of Jimmy's fucking high uh, highfalutin <laughs> bullshit hanging out with the Italians. We're just gonna kill them, and we're not. They're not even thinking about. Okay, well, maybe what, what the ramific what the ramifications? What, are? what if Gotti doesn't like that? What if the Gambinos move against us? They don't even. They don't even think about that. It's just like well, then uh, kill Gotti. But Gotti put it. We said at the beginning of the show. You know who replaces Coonan when he's off the streets? One of Gotti's guys, Bosco. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, sorry. I'm but Featherstone eventually gets jammed in 86 or 87, uh, and they convince him to flip. Yeah. So they don't kill Coonan. They they right. um they actually have hit squads looking for him, but they can't they can't find him. And in the meantime, right, Featherstone, I think it was a Rico case, if I'm not mistaken. I, I can't remember the particulars of what he gets jammed up for. It was, racket, it was racketeering. Racketeering, okay. So um he starts cooperating with the feds and that, you know, that that's bringing us to the, to, to the end here. Um, it's basically like the, I mean, go through the other parallels here, Sammy Gravano flipping, um, Billy Stevie Flemmy, uh, or, uh, you know, the, 
Phil Leonetti, right? Like when the number Shameless two plug, go buy Mafia Prince if you haven't. Oh played. yeah, great book. Sal Vitale in the banana. Like yeah. when the number two guy flips, um, you're pretty much toast if yeah. you're if you're the it's boss, che- right? It's, it's checkmate. And Mickey Featherstone, you know, to to do this kind of compare and contrast again, we're now almost forty years removed from the heyday. Um, Jimmy Coonan's fighting for his freedom in his seventies. Mickey Featherstone's been free for 30 years, 25, 30 years. I think he might have been 10 years. Um, And he's living somewhere in the United States, you know, 74 years old, I think 75 years old. And uh, has been free for for quite a while, living under, you know, a a new identity. And I think you, if I'm, if uh, you don't mind me saying, I think you had some kind of, communication with him or his camp about his him people, coming on yeah. the show but it just didn't it just didn't he happen. disappeared his nephew reached out a couple years ago um i'd love for if you're listening yeah, uh, yeah. contact us again we'd love to have mickey on to, to talk about uh his time in the westies and you know his his take on all of this but uh yeah he's out there somewhere uh, out, out there somewhere just like phil leonetti you know when i when i was writing phil's book i never went to where he was. I, I still don't know where he lives. I don't know what his name is uh, now. Uh, you know, he was brought to me and I met him at, you know, hotels in different cities. Uh, but, you know, these guys don't, uh, they don't disappear. They're, they're still, you know, flesh and blood. They're just living a, under an assumed identity in another part of the country and trying to either forget about it or, or put all the, the nasty violence and Machiavellian conspiracies, uh, you know, in, in, in their past. Well, and Phil and Gravano, some of these guys tell their story. I don't think Featherstone has ever gone public. No, so it no. would be interesting to hear from him in some Gravano, show or whatever. Gravano's, Gravano's really public at this point. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. No, of course. So let's just have an obituary here. What, the the Westies don't go away necessarily when Kunin is incarcerated. You want to like kind of put the yeah they the, you know remnants of the group still existed. Uh, I, I don't want to pronounce, but I don't know how to pronounce Bosco's last name. But he's he's like Eastern European. Uh, yeah, I don't even think he was Irish. Right, I think you're right. Yeah. But it was kind of put in there. Uh, he he led what was left of them. For a period of time, but I, I don't really think there's a functioning New York Irish organized crime group anymore, and I don't think there has been for a couple decades. Probably. No, I don't. I don't think so. And, and part of that was just like you said, these guys going to prison, and then and it ends up being a guy who's not even Irish uh, mm-hmm. who, who who takes over what's left. And hell's in, it, the also neighborhood point, just changed. I was gonna say, point out the fact that hell's ain't hell's kitchen ain't hell's kitchen anymore. Right. Right. Completely gentrified. It's it's not. Uh, yeah, the demographics has, change. Yeah, it has radically. zero zero zero. Uh, it has zero. Um, there's nothing in, at the core era of the Westies. That neighborhood. There's nothing that looks like that anymore. I mean, it, it's a complete 180 uh of, of what's going on in those neighborhoods it, those neighbors don't even lend themselves to you know organized crime activity even if somebody was inclined to try to uh be organized yeah and i think just to say something uh, to finish this up about irish american organized crime by the way a lot of the information Shout out to TJ English, Patty Wack, The Untold Story of the Irish American Gangster. And he wrote a book just about the Westies, which is a lot more, a lot more detailed. But um, there aren't many Irish gangsters left in North America. There's still some in Boston holding it down. Uh, but West, even, West End crew in Montreal. And West End crew in Montreal. But he, even in Boston, the Irish it's not the same yeah. as, as it was, but there's still some Irish guys. But but that's about it. I mean, um Philly's Philly's uh, Irish mob is you know, gone, dead and gone. Yeah. I mean, you, you still have gangsters who are Irish American, but in terms of like being part of a Irish crew or Irish organized crime uh, group, I, I, that's not many examples left. 
And I, you know, as we wrap up here, if you're interested in this and you, and you want a Hollywood adaption, State of, Gra- uh, State of Grace is a incredibly underrated OC movie, in my opinion. Yeah, it's it, good. It's a fictionalized version of the Westies, but it's pretty much the story we just told you. Um, and it stars Ed Harris as a character based on Jimmy Coonan and Gary Oldman with a character that's, I think, somewhat based on Mickey Featherstone. But in the movie, they're brothers. Uh, and Sean Penn is actually the lead in it. And he plays a, a guy from the neighborhood that leaves, becomes a cop and then comes back without the, the Hell's Kitchen neighborhood, know, knowing that this character that he plays is now an undercover police officer and he uh, infiltrates you know, Ed Harris's operation. Um, and they have all all of the interactions with the Italians are, are great. There's a scene where uh, Ed Harris is meeting with the Paul Castellano character and he's eating a breadstick. Oh and yeah. He, and he's like leaving crumbs. Yeah. And the the, uh, the mafia <laughs> don is basically like, oh you Irish guys, you're a bunch of slobs. <laughs> and, do, do, do I need right. to have you know someone come and clean up for you? Uh, like right. a, belitt- a belittling comment. Right. And and this is what rubs the rank and file the wrong way right. because Ed Harris is just he just pretty much takes it. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Uh so it's a great film. It's uh it's the movie that Sean Penn met his wife, Robin Wright, at. Uh, she plays the love interest. And it's one of the first movies for John C. Riley, who plays. Oh, I don't uh, remember him. But he's in that? I don't even remember. Yeah, he plays one of the, the mob guys that's formerly friends with uh, Sean Penn. And then when Sean Penn comes back, kind of links back up with him. Oh, and God, then, I don't even remember that. Yeah. And, he's in uh, Gangs of New York, which is another. Irish right. Well, and now he's a big time actor. Back of then, course, it was yeah. one of his first roles. And he's really good in it. Um, Gary Oldman's outstanding. He's awesome. Everything he does is good. Usually, there's a scene where they play the a Guns and Roses "Sweet Child of Mine" as he's beating the living daylights out of a guy that had spoken to his girlfriend in the wrong way. Gary Oldman's great in True Romance. Too. Yeah. Oh, that's his. <laughs> in Detroit, he's supposed to yeah. be in Detroit. <laughs> right. Right. He's great. Drexel, I like Drexel. almost everything he's done. Drexel. So yeah. So check out State of Grace if you've never seen it. Uh, another little nugget of information. The reason that that movie has gotten lost is you can, you can trace it back to one very specific thing. It opened the same weekend. Goodfellas opened uh, in 1990. (laughs) So that no chance you you lost, got lost in the shadow from day one. Um, I discovered it 15 years after that, or maybe 10 years after that. And I love it, but again, it, it's a fictionalized version of this story, and it, I think it's a it's a, it'd be a good uh, a good two hours of, of of time devoted to that if you if you're interested in great uh, gangster movies. Yeah, I, I, I like that film as well. And um, we um, and again, we just to wrap up here, we like to talk about all sorts of um, groups, right? It's not just the five families or other Cosa Nostra groups, Irish organized crime. Uh, black organized crime and gangs, drug cartels, Russian mafia. Uh, right now, if you're watching this, the the week before we just dropped an episode on the Pagans Motorcycle Club. So we like to talk about all aspects of 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 the underworld, and uh, we we enjoy doing that. So this was thanks fun. For, I liked it. it was yeah. it was really fun. I like these historical case studies. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato. I'm Scott Bernstein, and we're out. <laughs> <laughs>